It's a huge honor and a privilege to be a learner and to be at this conference with you and obviously with the speakers. And in my line of work, I get to go to a lot of conferences. And I would have to say that this is up there with the best that I've ever attended. Um, why would I say that? The quality, the content, and how it's actually been expressed with passion, with clarity, and with proven track record. Um, and I'd just like to call out the GEA Games Development team for curating um, this type of content for you so that you can obviously take it back um, and convert it into practice as, as coaches. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge somebody who's not here, but he kind of is here. And much of his thinking and his influence is inside me, uh, and I'm going to express it hopefully over the next 40 minutes. His name is Christian Penny. He was due to co-present with me today, but his mother died on Tuesday uh, in Auckland, uh, and it denied him the opportunity to actually be here to share with you. Um, he's part of the McCourt family, somewhere on the border region in Ireland, and part of his trip was he was going to find out what that Irish heritage was. Um, Christian joined my team a year ago. He was the first person I recruited into my team, um, and he was the CEO of Toy for Carry, which is New Zealand's top performing art school in Wellington. Uh, and I made a bit of a bold decision in that to enhance the growth and development of New Zealand's best coaches, I wanted to import new thinking from the world of performing arts. Um, and not only that, Christian brings an authoritative knowledge on Māoridom, or Tikanga Māori, which means the Māori way. And today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that as an Irishman who's still learning it. I'm 16 months in New Zealand. Um, so what I want to try and do is build on all of the other speakers. There's a a couple of key thematics coming out here around the importance of the North Star, the importance of identifying your ways of coaching or your ways of working or your values. Um, so for me, what I want to try and do is take a bit of a risk, and I want to stretch this about what can we learn from another country and their culture, which I actually believe is New Zealand's competitive advantage. And then I want to conclude, and I want to ask us here in Ireland, What's our indigenous culture? Our relationship with our language? Our relationship with our sense of place? And who are we really as a people? Because I believe the GEA is the last standing pillar in Ireland that actually communicates a uniqueness around Irishness. Um, and that's what makes today for me really, really special to contribute to this experience with you guys. There is no place like home. It takes leaving home, I think, to fully appreciate home. So 10 days ago, I came back to Ireland from New Zealand, went back to Galway. Um, every day when I was back in Galway, went for the swim in Black Rock, reconnected with the snack box, the old Supermax uh, special and Barry's tea. And I guess the irony is the further away I am, the closer I'm beginning to feel to home. I'm really beginning to question my sense of Irishness. And his excellence, uh, um, the Irish ambassador to New Zealand is here today, Mr. Peter Ryan. Um, and he's played a central role in me journeying into New Zealand, uh, getting settled, but also helping me to answer that question regarding who is Ireland? Who are we on the world stage? Um, and I guess when you're involved in a line of work, when you're competing at the Olympic level, um, understanding your ad advantage and your difference uh, from a global perspective is really, really important. Session flyover, I'm going to set the scene here and give you a bit of a sense as to just my background, the connection with the GEA, who do I work for, why am I proud to wear this jersey here today, and what does it actually represent. Then I'm going to unpick the co conference theme a bit, I spoke about it last night, but then I want to translate it into a New Zealand perspective. Uh, and in doing so, I'm going to highlight two to three critical indigenous practices that absolutely drive and enhance culture in New Zealand. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to try and gift you some things to think about in terms of how do you bring all this content to life? There's no point in being at a conference. Who am I? So we talk about culture and we talk about purpose. It's really important to establish your own sense of purpose. So about 10 years ago, I started to find a language around my sense of purpose. So inspiring people to grow and develop in a spirit of goodness. I'm pretty confident if I sat down with all of you and I shared this with you, which I've just done, you'd say, well, actually, that's what we do as coaches. We sit opposite people, 
We connect with people in order to make a difference. And that's what drives me. That's who I am. That's the essence of what's inside me in terms of what I want to build a life around. In my relationships, I aspire to achieve honesty, respect, and trust. And in terms of my career, I openly seek challenge in order to grow. Nothing grows if you don't seek the unknown in you and around you. I move into the gray, move into the dark, and try and grow and develop. So continual learning and growth is my mother, and making that impact and that difference. And I guess more recently, in the last five to 10 years, I've moved into the space of leadership. Um, and there are a couple of things that are really important to me. Vision, opening an office door and going to work for something bigger than what's there right now is really important to me. Having a vision and aspiring to achieve that. Um, integrity, being able to answer questions, hard questions, and being able to care for people around you, really, really important. And how I collaborate, I look at the people around me and how are they prospering as a measure of my prosperity. Um, and that sense of distributing that ownership and that opportunity, that responsibility evenly, um, and then learning. To the right-hand side is my mother. I think I get my fire and my desire for, for my, my work, my work rate, I think from her. And my dad on the other side spent 50 years selling shirts on the shop street in Galway. Um, and I think he sold more than a shirt. I think he sold a bit of old school custom um, in his connection with each customer. Um, so that piece regarding people connection and that value of people, I think, comes from him. Career background, I haven't arrived here in a straight line. It's been one windy road. I've been quite fortunate. My first job was as a professional soccer player for Aston Villa. I grew up in the 90s dreaming, um, Italian 90, of becoming one of those boys in green. Um, uh, so that notion of what happens in the world stage in terms of how, how athletes perform and how Irish teams are doing does translate into young people forming a dream. And, and gaining that sense of possibility regarding excellence on the world stage for our country. Um, moving from there, I um, spent the vast body of my time in Ireland, so I, I was kind of a student athlete for six years. Um, transitioned into DCU, studied sports science, met an amazing mentor and professor, Niall Moyna, who's here somewhere. Had a huge impact on my growth and development. If you want to accelerate your development, surround yourself with some wise owls who are prepared to ask you hard questions um, and guide you in terms of answering those questions. Retired out at the age of 24 due to injury, and that's really where I wanted to become a bit of a trip advisor for athletes, because a lot of the experiences I had in terms of failing, coming out of Aston Villa, coming back to the League of Ireland, I wanted to become a trip advisor for athletes. So I worked in the whole athlete career development space in the Irish Institute of Sport for four years. Um, then I studied coaching, but from a business perspective in the Irish Management Institute, which was pretty cool. Uh, and in 2009, I took up my first ever um, uh, football coaching role. And I was with a group of underdogs called the Irish Paralympic Football Team. So my context here was young men with cerebral palsy, which is a motor control condition where essentially the wiring in your body doesn't enable you to move the way in which you would like. Um, so over two and a half years, we went from sixth in the world to num number four and we became European medalists in 2010. It was an absolute privilege to coach those players in that context, uh, and many of them I still remain in contact with. Coming out of the London 2012 Games, having spent six years working with our best coaches, um, my rate of learning dropped off, and I wanted to seek another challenge. And another incredible mentor to me has been Pat Daly, and I said, Pat, what's your biggest problem right now? And he said, dropout. I said, well, the biggest thing I want to study is relationships. Can we merge the two? And he said, yeah, let's do it. Um, so the presentation I made last night was around that journey with the University of Stirling over three years to test and prove a way to engage young people in GA games. I got married in 2011 with three kids under the age of six, and we made the brave decision as a family, is there another experience outside of living in Drada? And we moved to New Zealand. We moved to New Zealand October 2018. And the real reason for moving to New Zealand, I was frustrated in my context. My rate of learning, the rate of innovation, the ambition wasn't there for me at a sufficient level for me to want to actually stay. I wanted to go and take myself and my family to the world 
um, and really try and continue to learn, grow, and develop. My impact with the GEA, this is my great granduncle Mick Gill, three-time All-Ireland winner. He's the only man to win two All-Irelands in the one year uh, in 1923-1924, which is an incredible stat. My underage participation, like most of you, Rahun Hurling, uh, um, Rahun Newcastle Hurling Club in Galway in the 80s and 90s, St. Michael's Gaelic Football Club uh, in Galway as well. Two incredible clubs, um, had really positive coaching experiences there. Um, under a range of great coaches. For four years, I actually managed this very event that you're here today at uh, and worked closely with Jimmy, Peter, Quiva, David in the games development team. So I really get a unique understanding and appreciation of how hard these guys work to create this learning feed that you're having today. Um, and I learned a lot during that particular period. Ta talked about the PhD. Uh, and then two seasons ago, I was asked to get involved with a senior hurling team called Clare. I didn't decide to get involved with Clare until after they finished their National Hurling League campaign in 2017, 2018, and then I came in and I did a, a review. And then I previewed the All-Ireland series, helped them to see some levers, and off they went. And we got to the semi-final under the leadership and management of two incredible um, managers, um, but more importantly, an incredible group of young men. And to see hurling play that full tilt uh, across the country was a joy, was a joy. Um, and it is the epitome of high performance. It is the epitome of high performance. To see games with scores of 30 to 40 scores over 70 minutes, um, it's entertainment gold dust. Why did I move to New Zealand, expose my family to a new culture? My kids go to school every day without shoes on in New Zealand, such as the um, the weather, such as the outdoor um, opportunity where you can stay outdoors um, when you're at school, um, so they don't wear shoes, which is a really, really strange thing. Um, but when you see it in New Zealand, um, it's actually quite normal. And the other point was to genuinely, genuinely pursue a world-leading standard. I think to get better, you have got to dive into the unknown. You've got to seek the gray. You've got to seek the uncomfort in you and the reality around you and move into it. Um, I'm 16 months into that and it's been incredibly challenging, but incredibly enriching. Who do I work for? High Performance Sport New Zealand. So we're a crown entity. We're a similar agency to the Irish Sports Council, the, the Irish Institute of Sport. So we're a one-stop shop where we distribute $66 million which is 47 uh, million euros per year to 500 plus athletes, 90 coaches across 14 sports. It is the number one high performance system in the world for populations below 5 million. 18 medals at the last Olympic Games and year on year since this organization came to life, um, just prior to the London 2012 Games. And I think the key point of difference is this organization is very targeted. We know what we're looking for in an athlete and we have the ability to create a really effective support around that athlete so that we can realize that potential. I lead a team of five people who go to work every day to challenge and support coaches to get better at what they do. And I have a budget of $2.8 million, which is a very significant resource. I ran a similar reality in Ireland with one twelfth of the resource. Um, so they're spending more money, they know what they're looking for, um, and the proven success has been there over the last, over the last um, eight years. Here are three Irish people who I go to work with every day, and they're absolutely incredible, as good and as incredible as Des Ryan. And I think sometimes we can under, under we don't back ourselves on the world stage, because sometimes, I, well, I don't think we think enough about ourselves in the world scene. Ken Lynch, who heads up our athlete development, he's an Arsenal fan, I won't hold that against him. Carolyn McManus who's the head of physiology with New Zealand Rowing, which is like a truly world-class high-performance program. And then we've got Graeme Shaw, who's head coach for the New Zealand ladies hockey team, who previously came from Ireland. When I started to work with Graeme just after the 2012 Games, he'd literally just retired, and he started as a development coach on a Pursuit of Excellence program. Six years later, he's leading a world-class team now into uh, the 2020 Games. So the conference team on pick, guys, values, behaviors, and culture. It's really interesting how we've looked at it. We've looked at it from bottom up and top down. 
We've looked at it in terms of the granularity of behaviors, values, and culture. We've also looked at it from culture, values, and behaviors. The challenge, I think, with achieving great culture is it is easier said than done. It's easier, it's easy to write it down than it is to actually bring it to life. It's easy to destroy it, and it's harder to build it. Why? Because I think no two people are the same. To, to create gravity amongst a group of people around a common goal creates a type of leadership um, around trying to identify in people what they possibly haven't recognized, and then trying to align them to a common goal and vision and to go on a phenomenal journey. The links between people are invisible. We can't actually see them, and we, we can be quite rationalistic around, well, if we can't see it, it doesn't exist. But these links are there, and it requires continuous maintenance, just like a gardener pulling the weeds out of a garden, making sure it's watered and it's nurtured. So for me, this is the best definition of culture that I've come across. Culture is a, a, set, a living set of relationships working towards a common goal. It's not something you are, it's something you do. 20 years ago, after getting sacked by Aston Villa, uh, before I moved to um, uh, New Zealand, I actually went back to Bodymore Heath, our training ground. And I walked into the training ground, and what I observed and what I sensed was a club in crisis. Um, what were some of the observational markers? All of the posters in the environment were related to a European success in the early 80s. They were thinking past tense. The doors were hanging off the lockers in the, in the, in the dressing rooms. Um, the environment was all segregated and boxed off. The first team players, their canteen was separated from the young players to totally different eating spaces. In that observation, I, come, I came to appreciate that this isn't a culture and an environment that's truly about excellence and collaboration. So for me, the key features are getting clear on the purpose. Why do we exist? So I talked about diving into the unknown. If you don't know the answer to that question as a coach, hold onto the question and figure it out. Why do you exist? Why do you practice? What do you want to achieve with that practice? And then ask yourself, is that what the players want as well? And getting clear on whose roles, who does what, around that sense of vision and mission. And then enable people around you to go and achieve, achieve that. Hand over that, that, that responsibility and provide that autonomy to go and do that. One of the best ways to hand over autonomy is just to ask a question. And the final thing, I guess, there around just that, in terms of what's in the relationship, it's really important, I believe, as a coach, to practice vulnerability. When you don't know, say you don't know. Um, when you're on a journey with a team and it's difficult and it's impacting you and your family, describe that impact. Deepen those relationships. Um, by having that degree of authenticity. So that's my, my sense around what great culture looks like, what it feels like. Um, and Daniel Coyle's book is a really, really simple read um, and a really, really good one around the culture code. I've been quite fortunate to study culture in a range of different domains from special forces in New Zealand and in Ireland from a military perspective. Um, across the 14 sports that I work into, but also um, in business as well. Let's switch the focus to New Zealand. Well, what could we possibly learn from New Zealand? And this is a really interesting slide because hopefully when Pat Daly comes down to New Zealand early in the year, I'm going to actually ask the same task where, where um, ta task the Kiwis, what could we learn from Ireland? Because what we have here within our Gaelic games, it's completely original and unique. Um, and I look forward to presenting that. But ultimately, what's happening here? Brian O'Driscoll is reaching down. He seems to be picking up something from the ground. There's a Maori warrior who's approached him in the airport. What's that about? The haka on the right-hand side, which was a brilliant insult, was placed by a journalist in Ireland around the haka on the lead into the World Cup, which was just, just reading it, was just loaded with absolute ignorance. Um, but what is the haka about? 
What is the nature of that custom? And I think when you look inside a culture, you see rituals and customs alive. Uh, and then finally, we see Ronan O'Gara doing the hungi uh, with a, Ma a Maori leader in the image on the right-hand side. What's happening there? Why are they joining heads? What the hell's that about? Let's just lean in on one, which is the haka. Ha, ko te ha o te manawa. Ka, ko te ka o te ahi. Ha, ka, e ka na te ha. He kupu muhani. He kupu whakapara hako. Ko tā te kai haka. He karanga i te wairua o tū mātou enga. Ko te rau paraha te tahi rangatira nui o Ngāti Toa Rangatira. Nā nā nō te haka nei a kamate kamate. I te tahi wā, Kahuna ia ia ki roto i te rua kumara, nō nei o mana i te hoariri. Ā, ka nōhia a runga o te tomokanga o taua rua e tētahi wahine. E rua ngā whakatata ngā teito, kawehe atu ai. Ko te wahine, te tangata pūhuru huru, nāna nei i whakapiti te rā. Ko te hūpane kaupane, ko te rauparaha te rā e putāna i te rua. Nā konei, It's an honor to receive that haka. Even though it's a very ferocious, I suppose, uh, the way you deliver it, you're honoring those opponents that you're coming up against. So we as the Māori people are very worried that we're lo losing our language, we're losing our tikanga. But at schools such as this one here, they are very strong, and we hope that it goes into the future. So here again, the haka will take us forward. The haka you have taken as the All Blacks to the world. Every time you get up and do the haka, or no matter where, you represent the god of war. And so as you stand, you also represent your people. You, as the warrior, are the shelter of our people. What the haka means to me, it's like real unique, you know, as a Māori, kind of being surrounded by that, and you know, that's what separates us from the world. It's, um, it's pretty, a pretty cool feeling to know that. I was watching the All Blacks do it from a young age. We wouldn't really know exactly the, the words or the actions, but we enjoyed doing it, and I never thought I'd be able to do it with the understanding I have now. ties you in and connects you with the people you're performing haka with and also the people that have been there before. And I always think of my family while I'm doing the haka and trying to make them proud and our country proud. I feel connection um, with our team when we haka, but I also feel connection with the land. Haka helped me 
um, become the man that I am today, and it's something that I, yeah, I am proud of. Powerful, powerful to be able to reach that far back into your intergenerational wisdom and reach from that insight. To talk about sum summoning a light from within and the notion that each person, when you do the haka, you're standing for your people. And then to be able to do that through the medium of dance, Orla provided a wonderful example of that last night. Um, is the essence of that. I have a seven-year-old. It's highly likely next year she will be in a dance sequence doing the haka, and she's Irish. And the point of the criticism around the haka was that Kieran Reid was a, a European New Zealander. It's not the point. The point is, is that a dance and a custom like that can leverage all of the difference. And the meaning behind the ritual has a universal appreciation or an application irrespective of where you're from. Um, and that's what the real background and understanding is around that. My first experience around Maori Dom and, and Tikanga Maori and how they apply Maori practice, when I joined High Performance Sport New Zealand, there was 15 of us who joined over a period of about four or five weeks. And then I was told to come to this ceremony called a porphyry. And I was like, what the hell is a porphyry? Um, and this is, I guess, when you break down the word, similar to haka, just like our um, na native language, the words mean something. Uh, maybe unlike, uh, in contrast to the English language. But so po means night dark or unknown potential, and witty means to weave and work together. So if you picture this, you've got two groups in a room, a space in the middle. You've got on one side the people who are joining the organization, and you've got on the other side the people who are already in the organization. The new people are walked into the room and seated in the space where the new people are, and then one person on behalf of that group speaks into the setting. On the other side, people in the organization speak back into that, and over a period of time, the ceremony concludes where the new people have been woven into the existing fabric of the organization. And the last thing you do as you finish that particular ceremony is you complete the hungi. You join heads and you share breath. You share the same breath, which is one of the most um, intimate connections I've ever witnessed with another human being called the hungi. And there we are, just having completed it. Cle completed it. Even though the ceremony was completed in Maori, the indigenous language, my heart was just absolutely, the impact it had on how I felt was absolutely incredible. I felt I belonged to this organization. I just literally got off a plane. I was going to be three months in New Zealand without my wife and kids. The sense of belonging that I had at that stage was absolutely minimal. But the impact that this ceremony had, this ritual, this practice, um, was really significant for all 15 of us that joined the organization that day. This is just one of their practices in terms of how they see the world. Um, and it is very relational, um, and it's very much built ar around two main things, which is tika, which means right. So they're big on doing things right. Uh, and the second is pona, which means being real, being authentic. Um, if you're sitting opposite a Kiwi or um, a, a person who comes from a strong Maori background, they want to see you. Who are you really? Who are you really? And they will not collaborate with you till they understand who you are and where you come from. Um, 
So on my team at the moment, I've got this amazing leader, this amazing influence, this new wave of wisdom and knowledge, which is brilliantly helping us as a coaching team to support the coaches to connect deeply with one another and then to learn in a deeper way. And in doing so, they get better at what they do. But not only that, they create better environments and uh, ecosystems in the sports that they work in. And our vision is really trying to bring about that community in that type of a way um, into the future. So at the heart of what we do, we have a Coach Accelerator program, which is in existence since 2009. Every year, we take on between 8 to 14 coaches onto this program. The program goes for three years. And over that three years, we incubate the development of a world-class coach. How do we do that? Um, you go through 10 residentials. Each residential is five days long, and each residential will typically focus on a theme which is absolutely central to being a world-class coach. We don't just look at the coach as a coach. We look at the coach first as a person. So just like Chris was looking at the athlete or the player as a person, we too look at the coach as a person. You cannot sustain uh, world-class coaching practice without having um, the lifestyle and the well-being ultimately to do so. So this is a series of test events that we completed on what are called um, a, a marae. It's called Manatuki Marae in Gisborne. And across New Zealand, there's over 700 of these marae. They're almost like clubhouses. Um, that would be the analogy for the GEA. So what we wanted to do was to expose the coaches to a unique way to connect with one another, but to learn together so that the coaches could walk out of that setting and actually bring that to life in each one of their particular sports. The three facilitators um, are connected with this marae and their families are connected with this marae uh, for many years. Um, the Maori people first arrived in New Zealand in the 12th century. Um, for, then a Dutchman arrived in New Zealand in the 16th century and said, hey, I found a new country. Um, and then in the middle of the 18th century, uh, the crown arrived. And they formed a treaty with the Maori people called the Treaty of Watangi, which has three Ps in it, which forms the very basis as to um, New Zealand's unique, unique history. So picture in New Zealand, there's actually 600 islands. There's a North Island and a South Island, which are the two big ones. The country is three times the size of Ireland, even though we have the same population. So there's a lot, many rural areas there. The population is more, more dispersed. So Gisborne is located on the North Island. You look down the map, and you'll see it on the East Coast. And very close to the coastline is Manatuki uh, Marae. And the facilitators were Tainan, Apaki, and Tijuana, who are absolute experts at bringing this indigenous culture to life. When you walk inside the furry, which is the house, well, you don't walk into it, actually. You've got to work your way into it. On the right-hand side, you can actually see a whole process here. And this is a sequence of engagement where the first three or four stages are about how the leader in the marae welcomes the person into that setting. And they do that in a very deliberate way. So when Brian O'Driscoll was picking up that feather, what that particular tribal leader was doing was provoking him to wake him up. To wake him up before we encounter. Because if you're not awake, you will not encounter. Um, and then Brian O'Driscoll accepted the challenge. And then the next stage of the process moved forward, where you go to Hongi, connect the heads, and then you get inside the house. So one of the key points here that we were trying to teach the coaches is the sequencing and the structure of your practice. How deliberate is it? How explicit is it around how you engage with the people around you? Over here, they would call this a human technology inside the house. So the house is typically made up of your four sides, dual panel roof, but then there's three poles holding up the roof. And the three poles represent three distinct pillars that they believe are critical sources which represent a human being. The back wall of the house, Potuaranga, represents your point of wholeness, which is really around your purpose and your intention critical pillar. The middle pillar represents your sources of wellness. What feeds you? What gives you joy? And the last pillar, and um, Potua Hau, talks about your, your practice. How you bring intention and purpose and wellness to life in the outer world outside the house. 
So we slept in this, in this uh, um, furry for four days as a community with this type of a guidance, ancient wisdom around us. Um, and for me, as somebody who arrived in New Zealand, it really helped me to check my purpose. It really helped me to understand, well, what are the sources of wellness around Dara Sheridan? What gives me life? And then finally, how do I bring those things to life when I go outside the door? What a simple frame around maintaining health and well-being as uh, an individual. So the house is viewed as a shelter and a map. So the question I pose to you is, could you create a situation where your clubhouse, your GEA clubhouse, is a shelter and a map? It's a place where you can come and restore yourself. It's a place where you can connect with purpose. It's a place where you can achieve wellness, but more importantly, it's a place where you can grow and develop in an abundant reality. Um, and I think this is the story that I'd like Pat to be able to share with the Kiwis when it comes down to New Zealand um, later on in the year. Lynn Gunson, who's uh, a key member of my team, she's over 40 years uh, in the high performance. She said to me, she said, Dara, with our team, the team I've just taken over, she said, it's really, really important that you help to build a house that can withstand any storm. Um, and I didn't really understand what she said when I arrived in New Zealand 16 months ago. Um, but our point was, how could we use purpose, intention, sources of wellness, and our application for, to guide and inform how we are as a team? So very early in my leadership journey, we sat down, we ultimately defined our purpose and our vision, and we identified our guiding values. And there are guiding values around when things get difficult. And we come up with an acronym called OUCH, which is openness, understanding, care, and honesty. And this is in a team where I just happen to be the leader, but I don't have superiority or primacy over, over, over anyone. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you, I'm not just talking about this today, I'm living it as a leader, because I believe in it. I believe in it because of how it impacted me there. And I think in a world where learning typically starts here, how about starting it here? And Pat would have cited that uh, in his opening presentation. Can we learn from Tena, Napaki, Tijuana, and Christian Penny? You cannot be explicit enough around your setup and your approach in terms of how you create a setting to which players are going to come into. Be explicit around your process. Share it. And don't give away your time and energy easy. Ensure that the players, when they do come into the environment, they're really aware of why you're there and what you want to achieve as much as why players are there and why, what they want to achieve. Maximize the available resource. The biggest resource you have is the person opposite you and what they know that you don't know. And that's a key theme that's come out over the last uh, day and a half. To access that depth in another person, be yourself, but be, be clear um, and be open around the things that you don't know. And be generous around that. And finally, accelerating the learning, be courageous around the unknown. The name of the marae that we were in in Gisborne was Rokuto, which means dive into the unknown. For the GEA to sustain itself, to be in the unique position it has at the moment, Everyone in the room needs to continue to dive into the unknown. Society is changing, and our response to that requires us to always um, respond in a way around the challenges and the difficulties, which largely start with an experience around the unknown. So my gift to you, everyone in the room, activate the bottom and come down off the top. Take a partnership approach. Look at your player. Look at the team around the player. Think with you versus not to you. Be clear on your mission and your values. In New Zealand, they call that go slow to go fast. Set up for success. Be clear on what that looks like. And then stage meaningful encounters. Recreate the problems and the challenges of the game. Coaching solutions and coaching things that work um, it's a dangerous trap to fall into because the game isn't a game where things always go your way 
As Chris said this morning, it is chaotic, and it is random, and it is unpredictable. Demonstrate vulnerability in adversity. Look at the Prime Minister of New Zealand. One of the key values she talks about is kindness. Look at the way and what she represents around the adversity that has been experienced in New Zealand recently, and look at the behavior of other leaders and the impact that that's having. And then finally, fill the cup. Ensure that the players are, have a feeling leaving you in your practice where they have a desire to want to come back. Thank you for this opportunity to be amongst you, to learn from you, and thank you to the GEA for this great invitation. Um, this is an organization since 20 years ago when I first came in contact with them. The growth and the development is absolutely astounding. And you are now at a level, they are presenting to you a level around world class. Embrace it and bring it to life in your daily practice. Thank you.